All right, this is chapter two of the wireless and mobile device security, or as we call it, mobile device and wireless security. This is about wired in wireless networks. Okay, I'm not showing to you full screen because I want to bring up, possibly bring up some other stuff on the screen, but you can still see it. All right, we're going to cover some stuff about, obviously, like I said, wired and wireless networks. Okay, all right, let's start right here. First of all, we have the OSI model. The OSI model, Open Systems Interconnect model, was actually, like it says, out for a long time. Never really used. There's a couple easy ways to remember it. Programmers do not throw sausage pizza away, or everybody seems to need data processing. But either way, it came out in 1984 as a kind of conceptual model of how a network would work. It never did get implemented, but the way it functions is still important. Said it's a standard for communications protocols and defined seven layers, which we are going to look at. Okay. Here is our layers. We have the application, presentation, session, transport, network, data link, and layer and physical. If you read from the top, all people seem to need data processing or programmers do not throw sausage pizza away. Those are an easy way to remember the different names. Okay. This is used today, but it's now called the TCP reference model. And I think I can probably find you a picture of it. Let's see here. TCP. All right, let's see what we got. Oh, yes, there we go. Let's see if we can get a nice image of it. You'll see here in this image, we have the OSI model on the left and the TCP model kind of in the middle here. What happens is... You know, up here at the top, we're going to talk about more of these in great detail, but the application, for instance, say Outlook, okay, it manages my email. Well, it also handles presentation and session. So, you know, all that, <clears throat> it's like your web browser, HTTP actually handles presentation, so it actually creates a session. So, these three are all linked together. And also the data link and physical are linked together into the network interface. It's all done on our network card now. So they, even though we're not actually using this seven layer model, we are using something that's basically the same. Okay. Application, the user interface, that would be your email program, the data format. We're going to actually go through each one of these. Okay. <clears throat> it says inter stack communication is accomplished through use of headers and Actually, you know what? I'm going to pause this for a second so I can capture a piece of traffic and I'll show it to you. Hold on. I'll be right back. All right, here we go. I brought up Wireshark. Now I'm going to just go in here and go to Capture. Basically, if you don't know where Wireshark is, it's a network analyzer. You get it from Wireshark.org. I'm going to Capture. Select the interface. I only happen to have one interface on this machine, so I'm all set. A lot of machines might have two, so you might want to go Capture Interfaces and select the one. Now, you'll notice here I'm actually... I don't know, it's hard to see. There you go. But you'll actually see I'm getting some data even without me doing anything. I'll show you why. Okay. So there we go. I'm capturing some data. And I'm just going to capture a little bit here. See, I'm actually doing nothing. I'm not touching the keyboard, not touching the mouse, yet I'm getting data. Most of this is broadcast. Okay. I stopped it now. Let's look at some of it. ARP, for instance, is a protocol, address resolution protocol. What it does is it determines. IP address to MAC addresses. And if I would expand down here at the bottom, you will see part. Actually, let me start from this way. There we go. All right. You see, we have an R packet. Okay. And this happens. Let's see, which one am I on? Am I on this one? So this is a broadcast packet. The way you can tell it's a broadcast is up here at the address section right here. The source is a particular IP address. In this case, Happens to be 104.214. Why do I even have that on my net? Wait, I'm looking at the wrong packet again. Urgh. Okay, I'm looking at the wrong packet yet again. I got too much stuff on my screen here. This is most likely a printer. Okay, that's weird. But it's a broadcast packet destined for FFFF. What that means is it's a packet going to everybody. ARP says, hey, do you happen to have this address? If you do, tell me. And it's it's coming back to 10.50.200.31, okay? It actually tells you that right here, the sender's IP address. 
Okay, but the whole point I want to show you here is, let me see if I can find another packet that shows it a little bit better. Most of this is going to be broadcast. So we're not going to get, there's a TCP packet. That'll have some stuff in it. Okay. You have the TCP protocol, but up here at the frame, you'll see we actually have, you know, how big it is. You'll see the header length. You'll see the arrival date and time. Then you'll see the Ethernet 2. You'll see the addressing. All these are components that work in the TCP model, especially in the address, which we're going to talk about here in a second. Uh, you'll see the different protocol we use. IP, we could use TCP or IP. Uh, <coughs> uh, excuse me. Um, I'm sorry, TCP or UDP, but either one of them both use IP, and we're going to talk more about that as well. But you can see that this packet is broken into sections. We have the frame, we have the Ethernet, we have the IP, then we have the TCP. In different components of the same packet, you know, broken up. So let's let's go over here and look now. Okay, so the data is created at the application layer. That would be like your email program, and sent down the stack. So it goes application, then presentation. But as we talked about, five, six, and seven are actually linked together all in the application layers now. Okay, so as each layer adds its own set of instructions for this corresponding layer, so we keep adding a little bit more by a little bit more. Okay, layer three and four are the TCP or uh, where, where we, here we go three and four. So now we have the the transport and the network. I just changed my page here. Okay. These are the closely associated due to the use of the TCP IP protocol. TCP IP is what's called a protocol suite. It actually makes up a whole bunch of stuff. Obviously, TCP, UDP, but also includes um, UDP, IP, HTTP, ARP, DNS, DHCP. It includes all kinds of different protocols in that suite. Okay, so the function lines between switches and routers now blurred. <clears throat> in the past, we had a lot of hubs. And we had some routers. Now we got switches. So what's happening nowadays is switches actually can perform routing as well. Okay. Like I said, layer two and three are no longer sole domains of switches and routers. They actually can perform each other's things or each other's functionality. So the OSI layers can communicate only with the layer above and below them. But as I mentioned, the TCP model, they're really kind of, we don't really do it that way anymore. Okay. So how do we talk over a network? Okay. This is the two main communications over network. We have <clears throat> conditioning the data and then ensuring the data reaches the correct. So in other words, getting the data put together and then the addressing or the delivery of it. Those are the two main components of a network. And we're going to look at each of these. Okay. Role of the different layers is condition data for transport over the network to be reassembled by the application at the other end. So what happens is, um, think about it, um, we well, go to the grocery store, and I'm picking up individual items all throughout the store, putting them in my cart, and they end up in a bag. Then the bag is transported to my house. Then the bag's brought back into the house, and it's disassembled, basically, onto my counter again. And then I put them away. Same thing kind of happens on a network. We take the individual pieces, we format them, we break them apart, send them across the network. And at the other end, you know, they're put back together again. And how does it get there? Well, the communication it talks right here at the bottom bullet is how it gets to so the IP addressing is the important part. Think of it like an address on a letter. Okay, You have the name, the street, the city, state, and zip. That is how we address a letter. Well, computers address differently. Now we're going to look at those. This is IPv4, and if you look at this here where I showed you, you see this packet is actually using IP version 4. Okay, we're going to look more about that in a second. It says use a format called dotted decimal. Okay, and if you were to go on my YouTube channel, you could find a lot of videos where I talked about IP addressing. Okay, so what it does, dotted decimal, in other words, these are decimal numbers with dots between them, four numbers. They can range between 0 and 255, can't go above that. Okay, so it uses a format called dotted decimal, which consists of four octets. We got octet one, two, three, and four. Each octet is eight bit binary number. And I'm going to bring up the calculator here to show you. Okay, so for instance, on this example on the screen, I'm going to go to view programmer, make it a little bit, move it over here a little bit. Okay, so I'm going to type in decimal 
198. And that actually can convert it to binary very easily by clicking the binary button. Now, um, I do have a recording up there. Um, I remember what's the class and you can find it. But I talked about converting number bases is actually very easy to do. I'm just not going to get into it right now because you should have known this from Intro to Networks course. Okay. Oh, by the way, you can also go to Octal and Hex and all that very easily. Okay. All right. So we have our dotted decimal notation. Total number of combinations is more, more than four trillion, but we don't use a lot of them. Okay. We actually ran out of addresses already. It says here on the bottom bullet, address space is already used up. We're already transitioning to IPv6, and we're going to talk about that here in a second. Okay. They. By the way, they are. Fully compatible with, with each other. IPv6 can transport IPv4 packets. Um, I was reading an article on the web somewhere. I forget where it was at. But they were talking about how we're out of addresses with IPv4. So we're all going to have to switch to IPv6. And nothing's compatible. So we're going to have to literally replace every item. Which is a bunch of crap. Alright. Let's continue. Now subnetting. Well, if I hit the right button. Subnetting. Think of subnetting like a city, like a zip code, okay? If I told you I lived on Treeline Drive, could you find my house? Well, I'm going to bring up Google Maps. Now, this will probably, yeah, since I'm logged in, darn, it's going to remember where I'm at. Well, heck. Okay. Well, I just typed in Treeline Drive. Now, obviously, it's going to remember my address at the top. But you can see it also says there's Tree Line Drive in Texas, and another one in Texas, and another one in Texas, and there's also ones other places. Okay. What if I wanted to go to, let's find something that's not in my, my memory here. What if we went to um, A, get okay, Adair Boulevard. Okay. Well, heck, there's, a, well, well, there's two of them on there. Okay, Adair Boulevard is right here by our school. But you can also see there's an Adair, <clears throat> Adair Boulevard in Spencer, Oklahoma. How about Geary Road? <clears throat> okay. Geary Road. You'll see there's a Geary Road in California. There's one in Kansas. But there's also one in Connecticut, where I'm originally from. So, the point is, the zip code is how we determine what city we're in. Okay. So if I just gave you Geary Road, you wouldn't know between California and Kansas and Texas and Connecticut and wherever. You just would not know. So what happens is the SubNMS helps us determine that. It says, enable network engineers to segment devices called hosts within the network. It teaches us using basically a 32-bit mask. Um, another way you can also think about it, um, what if we did not have any rooms in this building? What if we had just one huge room? And all the classes met at the same time, you know, or in the same room. That would be tough because all the instructors would be lecturing on top of each other and the students wouldn't be able to tell who they're hearing. So we segment the rooms out into different classrooms, the same with the network. We segment our huge network into smaller pieces by subnetting. Okay. And we move on. Okay. Again, they don't go into a lot of depth on here, but you're sure to learn that in Intro to Networks anyway. Okay, now let's talk about NAT and DHCP. Okay, uh, NAT and DHCP, uh, NAT is Network Address Translation. Okay, if I was to bring up my handy dandy web browser again, and if I was to go type in IP chicken, you will see this is my IP address. If you went now, this does not pertain to the cyber labs, but if you went from a normal computer on campus, any of the office machines, any of the regular computer labs, and went to IP Chicken, we all would have the same IP address. So does that mean that every machine on campus is actually addressed the same? No, it does not. And I'm going to show you what that is. So if I was to bring up handy dandy command prompt and I type IP config, you see my IP address is actually 10.50.200.34 okay that's my internal address so you see my external address is 164.58.104.12 my internal is 10.50.200.34 what we're using is network address translation to communicate between them it says a method to mask the address of devices on a network from the outside world to the outside world that's my address to the inside world that's my address, okay? 
So using that, a company can have one public address, which can be accessed from the internet, and another set of private addresses, okay? Well, how are these addresses assigned? Something called DHCP Dynamics Host Configuration Protocol. Protocol. Now, if I type IP config all up here at the top, you will see DHCP is enabled. It's right here in the middle of the screen. So what that means is Roche State is automatically assigning this address to me. Now, I have a reservation. So that means no matter what, I'm going to get this same number. It's based on my MAC address, right, which is right here. This is my physical or my MAC address. But still, I got my address automatically from our server. It was handled automatically, and I can actually go down here and see that this right here, 10.1.3.74, is actually my DHCP server. Okay, used to automatically assign an address, okay? Uh, DHCP, um, let's, where's my Wireshark, Okay. I'm going to bring up Wireshark again. I'm also bringing up this at the same time. I'm going to capture again. I'm going to start capturing without saving. And I'm going to tell it... Uh, oh, this is going to kill me. I can't do this. Um, I'll just do renew. Okay, there. I just did IP config slash renew. This should... See, I don't know what it will... There it is. There's an IP... Well, where's the version 4? There it is. Okay, so what I did was I typed in ipconfig slash renew right here. It told the server I want to renew my address, okay? Then if you look right above the window, you'll see there's one up here. You see DHCP right here. That were 10.50 to 200.34. That's me, okay? I sent a request out saying, hey, I want to keep my address, the DHCP server right here, we saw my server was 10.1.3.74. You'll see that right here. That replied to me with the acknowledgement says, all right, Ken, I received that. You can keep your address. Okay, so it's pretty simple. Now, if I had lost or, re you know, released my address, I could type release there. It would have actually let it go, and then I could have renewed it. But I don't want to do that because I have active connections here. I don't want to screw up this recording. Um... DHCP uses a four-step process. It's called Discover, Offer, Request, and Acknowledgement. I can't show you any discoveries in here because I don't have any. But the first thing it does, a machine sends out a request, a Discover packet. It says, hey, I need an address. Can somebody give me an address? Then a DHCP server, just like this one here, would send it an offer. So D-O, think of Dora like Dora the Explorer. So it would send out a offer to the machine then the machine would then request it said hey i like that address can i have it and then it was acknowledged it. so d-o-r-a how is how that actually works used to automatically configure our machines okay now let's talk about ipv6 well we're out of addresses let me see how many i'm gonna go and google this might work how many ipv4 addresses are there okay i know there's none left there you go four billion addresses if we could use them all which we can't so really it's only 16 million now let's see how many ipv6 addresses there are 10 to the 38th power okay that's a lot <laughs> if you watch my other recording i talk about it and that's a lot of darn addresses so with D8, with IPv4, it's only a 32-bit field, okay? With IPv6, we're a 38-bit, it's actually 128 bits long, so it ends up being a lot more addresses, okay? 128 bit long allows more than 3.5 undecillion, okay? What the heck is an undecillion? What is an, what is an, under, it's like 50 zeros, I think. No, I'm sorry, 66 zeros. It's a one with 66 zeros. That's a lot of darn numbers. Okay. All right. So 3.5 undecillion addresses. It can be configured automatically. Address management, built-in security, optimized route. It's just pretty much there's enough addresses to give every person plus every square inch of area of the earth and the, of the moon an address. 
something like that I heard. I don't remember exactly, but okay. Let's continue on. Okay, it contains eight fields of four-digit hex numbers. Let's go back. What the heck is hex? Again, remember that was there was my decimal number. There was my binary number. Well, there's my hexadecimal number. It's just another way of representing numbers. Decimal works in base 10, 0 to 9, then we start over. Binary works in base 2, 0 to 1, and we start over. Octal works in base 8, 0 to 7, and then we start over. Um, hex works in base 16. And if you actually, let me bring this back in here again. So if you look, there's that. We have 0 through 9 are visible. We can't use these other buttons here, 0 through 9. If we go binary, we only get 0 and 1. If we go octal, we get 0 through 7. See that? If you go to hex, you'll notice we actually get all those plus all these are visible now. See, when I was on decimal, I couldn't use those. But when I'm on hex, I can use them. So let's just start here. Let's go clear this out. Where's C? I don't, I don't see clear on here. Well, we're going to go 1. Plus 1 equals, plus 1 again is 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Uh-oh, what happened? We didn't get 10. Well, actually, A in hex is 10. So 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Then A is 10. B is 11. Then 12. Then 13. Then 14. Then 15. Okay? Then after F restart all over again. Zero, one, zero. So that's not 10, that's 16 in hex. So if I go to decimal, it's 16. So decimal 16 is actually 10 in hex. Okay? Easy enough? All right. So four, eight groups of four hex, and you'll see them in here. There's four hex. You know, there's eight groups here. There's always four hex digits in them separated by colons, and if you have multiple zeros, you can get rid of them by putting colons there as well. I mean, I'm sorry, by just putting a zero, and getting rid of the duplicate colons, because we know that there's eight fields, okay? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Since these two are actually the same, we really could leave off one of them, and then it would automatically know that there's another zero belong in there. We can write shorthand, we get rid of all the other zeros as well. And yep, there you go. That's how we can actually do it without the zeros because we know that we can just leave those off, okay? Why is this not advancing? Come on, there it goes. Okay, now let's talk about the data link layer. It says, it says dominated by the ethernet protocol. Ethernet, a lot of people used to joke, they say, go lay me some ethernet. That's like a cable. Well, actually, Ethernet is not a cable. We do have Ethernet cabling, but that's just the, the standard that it goes by. Okay, Ethernet used primarily in LANs for switches to move data between machines. You know, that would be that network cable you've seen. Unlike IP, which is meant to connect LANs, Ethernet connects data between machines that are all on the same network. Okay, much in the way routers associated with layer 3 switches are with layer 2. Okay, but again, we talked about a minute ago, a lot of routers and switches are starting to perform the same job now. Okay, the physical layer, this is where we actually connect to our network. Okay, layer one, the physical layer, specifies standards for the medium over which it transfers. We have a bunch of different protocols. We have optical, sonnet, we have um, synchronous, we have DSL, we have ISDN, we have T1. I, ran, I had T1, multiple T1s in my house for a long time. Now we're all pretty much on broadband. Okay, then we have Ethernet, then we have Bluetooth, and wireless landers, all kinds of different ways. Okay. Now, let's talk about from wired to wireless. Okay, 1985, the FCC came out and said, hey, you know what? We are going to do something with wireless. Okay. So what they gave us is the 900 megahertz is the two and the 2.5 megahertz and the 5.8 gigahertz. I'm sorry, 2.4 gigahertz, not megahertz. Those, um, this is wait a minute, have been reserved, but they gave us another one. There it is. These were these were our. Um, remember the old cell not cellular phones we had the um, you know the cordless phones we had our house. These were the old cordless phones and stuff. Okay. 
says the FCC decision allowed anyone to use these bands as long as they manage interference with other devices. Okay, and there is actually a lot of them today, and I don't know, I don't know of an example I can show you about that. But pretty much everything is remote control nowadays, remote control ceiling fans, and everything else. Okay. Came out with the IEEE 1999, that's the Institute of Electronics and Electrical Engineers. We have a working group for wireless LANs. One of the first things they came out with was WEP, which we're going to actually do a project in another class. But came out with 802.11. You know, there's a bunch of different 802 standards. Let me see if I can find a list of them. 802 standard. Let's see if I can't find an easy list of them somewhere. Let's go to our wonderful Wikipedia. Here we go. You'll see a bunch of different standards for 802, okay? Uh, I asked the student way back when, can they help me figure out a way to remember them? Well, here's what they came up with. 802.3 was Ethernet. Three backwards is an E. 802.5 is like five golden rings, token rings. 802.8, eight is oct in German, so oct is like fiber optic, okay? 802.11 is like wireless. It's kind of like having your, you know, two antennas sticking up on your router. Just some stupid way it could actually works. I still remember them to this today. I just don't remember all of them. Okay. So 1997, 802.11, which became, which started the wireless network. Okay. Now we have ABGN and there's, oh, the, what, what was their new one I saw? I don't know. There's a bunch of new ones coming out in the near future. Okay. All right, impact, economic. It says, first wave of wireless revolution included early adopters as well as fixed line PC. You know, if you remember way back when they first were coming out with N, for example, I remember it was in draft for years and years, and everybody kept selling equipment listed as 802.11N draft, mainly draft one which is kind of like a beta version, and people were actually buying it. I'm like, why would you buy something beta 1? wasn't until draft 3 that they actually came out with a full standard, okay? So, why do we want all this wireless stuff? Like the second bullet, gateway to free public wireless broadband offerings. There's free wireless everywhere now. High-speed ADSL, it says fixed-line networks became common in residential, and people started offering Wi-Fi on top of that. Okay, it says ISPs often supplied Wi-Fi enabled gateways to their customers, and they are today. Okay, help Wi-Fi game transaction home small businesses, and as you know, it's available here at our school. All right, some of the technology. Okay, well, they're not going to go in. Where are they? They didn't really list them. Maybe, I guess they're going to cover them here. Okay. Okay, two, uh, 2013, the wireless land market estimated at $7.5 billion per year, dollar-wise. Wow, isn't that crazy? It says, half attributed to growth in enterprise space. Now, my question is, are we ever going to go get rid of wired networks for wireless networks? I don't know. Now, uh, third bullet, most are, most... Service businesses like coffee shops offer free access. McDonald's does. Wendy's does. Pretty much everybody has free wireless now. So why would they do that? Well, they want you to come in, sit down, use their wireless, which they're paying for, not you. Uh, actually, I remember when McDonald's started offering, they would actually charge you for it. Okay, But they want you to come in, sit down, and drink a cup of coffee, have fun. and start. I mean, what is Starbucks? Big old meeting rooms sometimes. You can go in there. Or how about Panera Bread? You can go in there. I've actually had lunch meetings at Panera Bread. Wi-Fi makes it easier that way. Okay. It says customers tend to buy other goods and services while they're there. Okay. I remember going to uh, the McDonald's on the I-44 uh, you know, the, the I up toward Tulsa. There was a Stroud McDonald's. You could get wireless, but you had to pay for it. And you actually had to go up to the counter and pay for it. You know, I didn't use it, but I was wondering, why wouldn't they... Can you imagine if they included it on the menu item? I'd like a Big Mac and a Wi-Fi, please. Wouldn't that be handy? I bet they would have sold a lot more. But now it's free, pretty much everywhere, okay? Also creates a regular and loyal customer base. So some, off, some hotels offer free network. I was on a cruise ship just recently. 
uh, over the holidays, and I bought the wireless internet package. It's not free on the cruise ship, but it's much cheaper than it used to be. And I was sitting, I mean, it's very slow. Oh my God, was it slow. But I was sitting there, and I brought up a program called Fing, F-I-N-G. Let me bring this up real quick. F, F-I-N-G. It probably tells you about the thing, Fing Network Tools right here. It works on Google. It works on Apple as well. It's kind of cool because what it does is it can show you which network you're connected to and all the different devices on the network. Well, I brought that up on the cruise ship, and there was over 3,000 connections, and it hadn't even loaded all the way yet. So it was crazy. Okay, So some offer free network access in the lobbies. Some have it in rooms. I was at a hotel in Austin. It was funny because they actually charged for Internet. Yet Austin, the city of Austin, Texas, gives free Internet citywide for free. So the hotel charged for it if you want to connect to theirs. But all I did was open my window and I had a perfect connection to the Austin wireless and used it for free. It was, it was kind of funny. Okay. Okay, how Wi-Fi affects developing nations. Can you imagine being out in, you know, a rural area? Can you actually run wires? No, there's no way. So Wi-Fi is the way to go. And it was actually an article. I just saw it. Was it Facebook? No. I just saw it. Where was... No, that's not it. I just saw an article about it. I don't know where it was at. But it was about how Google is planning on offering Wi-Fi. Oh, come on. I know you're in here. Let me... Uh, more. No. If you want it in the last... Here we go. Let's do the last. We'll say last week. Is this the one? My file with project. Uh, oh, well. I don't see it. Well, there was... I thought it was Google who was planning on doing it. Maybe it was Facebook. Let me, let me see if Facebook. I know. I'm sorry I'm making this recording longer than it needs to be. I don't know. One of them was planning to offer Wi-Fi through, it you know, looked kind of like a drone flying over the area. Okay. But the whole reason for this, like the first bullet says, many parts of the world lack physical infrastructure. Okay has resulted in the digital divide. More than 75% of the people in developing nations have access to the internet, 24% in developing nations, and internet makes things so much easier. You know, when I went to school, I didn't have internet. When I got my, actually my bachelor's degree, I didn't have internet. Can you imagine doing research without the internet? It's so much easier nowadays. So they're offering to get Wi-Fi out to make it easier for everybody. Internet of Things. That is the big thing you're hearing nowadays. This is refers to potential interconnectivity of virtual any electronic device that can be controlled and optimized via automation. Okay. At my house, I currently have cameras, obviously. I have a thermostat. I have my solar panels. I have a device, uh, I forget what it's even called now, where I can detect the, it's called TED, Total Energy Detective, can actually keep track of the amount of power I'm using in my house. Uh, obviously, my TVs are all wireless. My, uh, you know, I just got a lot of stuff, oh, lighting. I have lighting that's wireless now. My alarm system wireless. My home entertainment's wireless. So pretty before long, everything's going to be connected. I would love to see the day, I saw a commercial for it years ago, where they had a refrigerator that was wireless. You could actually, you know, use the internet on it. But imagine if one that kept track of how much milk you had. So if you wanted to, if you're at the store, you're like, do I need some milk? I could bring up my phone, connect to my refrigerator, see exactly how much milk is in there. And I actually heard an article about that where someone says they will be, you can set, their, their plan is to have it auto ship you items when you're running low. Can you imagine if you set the threshold of eggs to two eggs? The moment you hit two, down to two eggs, they automatically ship you a dozen eggs? That'd be kind of cool. So, all right. But that's just some of the new things that's happening in this area of wired and wireless. We're going to see more and more of it. Okay, and I lost my mouse. There's my mouse. All right, so we talked about a whole bunch of stuff here. Nothing in great detail, um, but at least we did cover some of it. All right, thank you much.